Good morning, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 14, 2023. I'm Dr. Yamonja Smalls, Director of Professional Development for Maryland's Department of Health Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to today's Rate Review Advisory Group meeting. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. One, all participants are in listen-only mode. There are two options to hear the webinar by computer and phone. If you look to the panel interface on your right, labeled audio, you can click either computer or phone to switch for the best option for your hearing. We will be recording the webinar and posting the session on YouTube and the DDA website. Today's PowerPoint has also been uploaded as an attachment and is available for you to download in the webinar panel box along with today's <clears throat> agenda. Questions can be typed in the question box question or chat box in the webinar panel, and the team will review and respond as appropriate. And now I'd like to introduce Deputy Secretary Bernie Simons to begin today's meeting. Good morning, Bernie. Good morning. Um, and as uh, you might have just said, I'm Bernie Simons, and I have the opportunity to serve as the Deputy Secretary in the Maryland Department of Health uh, Developmental Disabilities uh, Administration. And it's great to be here this morning. And I want to especially thank the members of the uh, Rate Review Advisory Group for volunteering your time. You know, this has been a, an ongoing process for a period of time now. And, I, you know, we really appreciate your participation in open and transparent process as we continue to review uh, the rates. Uh, and, and with that, uh, I'm going to turn this over to our Secretary uh, Laura Herrera Scott for some remarks. Thank you, Laura. Good morning. Hey, Bernie. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, starting to feel like fall, um, and hope everyone's transition back to school or work or, or you know, their fall lives is uh, um, going smoothly. Um, I, I, you know, like Bernie mentioned, I want to express my gratitude for your commitment and dedication throughout the cycle. You know, this is my first time going through this and, and everyone has really um, um, uh, not only helped the process, but certainly educated me uh, along the way. And so I uh, wanted to thank you all first and foremost. Um, but I also wanted to highlight some of the accomplishments um, um, from this uh, cycle or this season of the RAG. Um, my understanding based on last year and even prior years, uh, and at least from you know, my perspective, it's been a very productive cycle. Um, and though I know we still have more work to do um, and, and we need to continue to collaborate in future cycles, um, this cycle, the FY25 cycle has, you know, we've gotten several wins. Uh, for the FY24, rates. We've implemented rate increases to ensure the sustainability of services. Uh, it includes a COLA increase effective July 1, 2023, and an 8% inc uh, rate increase um, from January 1, 2024, which is these were planned accelerate. These were planned COLA increases in 25 and 26 that were moved forward. Um, so, so in, you know, that's certainly a win. We've also made adjustments to our rate components increasing the facility component by 30 percent for day hab services and raising the service adjustment component by 22 percent for fy 2025 and we've updated meaningful day base data uh, for fy 25 um, while excluding services where the data showed decreases so where the data was decreases we've held everyone harmless so, so that's a win and then we've also made significant progress in the training matrix uh, with community input uh, and we'll share updates to the required training lists uh, moving forward. And uh, while no changes are planned today for the rates, um, we're actively exploring improvements already for 2026 and we look forward to you know, ongoing impact input from all of you not only through this process but but certainly as this unrolls and uh nick burton will be in touch later in this presentation to give some of those highlights um, um so i just wanted to you know just point out some of the successes of this cycle and i i'm looking forward to another productive cycle when we resume in january 2024 um, but wanted to thank you all not only for your patience for with me and my new role but also um, for those of you who spent some time educating me, I've, I've learned a great deal and look forward to continue to 
um, work with you all to improve <clears throat> reimbursement and the system that we provide for, for clients. Okay, thank you, Laura. So, uh, you know, today's agenda starts with obviously the approval of the uh, last meeting's minutes from July, uh, status updates uh, from that meeting, action items that we had, and some clarification around FY24, the third quarter rates based upon our last uh, meeting. And, you know, so we review all of these decisions reached after considerable considerable feedback from the RAG, and, and then we're gonna discuss the timelines of the general ledger and how important that is for data. You know, data as we, we've we all uh, discussed in, in previous meetings, the last, uh, two, last two cycles, uh, last, last cycle and this cycle, uh, and you know, we're open for discussion and, and wanna continue to move forward with this. And, and data is, is extremely important as we all know to make sure that we have informed decisions. So obviously you can see uh, our action items here and the uh, next steps with the agenda one through seven. With that, I'll turn this over to Robert White. Thank you, Bernie. Um, the meeting minutes for July's uh, meeting were distributed to members on September 7th. Um, are there any revisions? Okay, hearing Rob, none. Yes. Robert, it's Chris. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are some key discussions within the, uh, the last meeting that are not reflected in the minutes. Uh, the conversation uh, surrounding billable, non billable time productivity, the entire back and forth between uh, the RAG and the Optimist team is void in the minutes. Uh, so I do think that they need to be looked at and kind of, you know, gone over again uh, and again there's key points in there that really that discussion is not even touched in the minutes and it's almost uh, 40 minutes of discussion okay, okay thank you chris um are there any objections to the revision that is being proposed by chris Okay, so as co-chair, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes uh, with the stated revision. Would a member like to second? I'll second. Scott. Great, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Okay, so uh, with the revision, the minutes are approved as revised. So Robert, just so everybody has an ETA, when when will we have the revised minutes so everyone can um, uh, um, see the addition? Can we just give an ETA just so people uh, know when to expect them? Yes, um, I would say by the end of day on Tuesday. Okay. Thank you. And um, I'm just to, to, to put Chris back on the uh, spotlight. I don't know, Chris, whether there's any way that you can give them some input on that, additional input just so we can get them revived the way that you pointed out. Yeah, just, you know, at, at about 35 minutes into the uh, to the meeting, we had a pretty healthy discussion, you know, regarding non-billable billable productivity, um, you know, for more than 30 minutes. And I guess it is, again, it's just not reflected. I mean, I, I prefer to wait to approve the minutes until we see it. It's such a significant uh, absence of information that I think I'd prefer to wait. Okay, thank you, Chris. So we'll go back and look, take a look at the video and, and make those revisions, and then we'll send those back out to, to the members for comment. Um, next slide, please. Okay, here's a list of the topics and the status updates that we will cover from the July meeting. Uh, we'll talk about Meaningful Day, both the facilities and program support components, and, and give this group updates on uh, some of the decisions that were made. Uh, we'll then 
talk about the general ledger template for FY24 data. Uh, and, and again, as Bernie said, and as a reminder, the general ledger template is a required submission due in September of 2024. And we, we really need to achieve 100% participation to ensure uh, the ability to use that data um, to update the rate methodology. <clears throat> we'll also- Robert? The, the, how, yes. I'm sorry, I couldn't find where to raise my hand. Um, uh, in maybe it was the last, I can't remember if it was the July meeting or another meeting, but I, I thought DDA had made the decision to move the template due date to December because of the issues with audit schedules. So Laura, what you are referring to are the audited financial statements. Uh, we moved that date to December uh, 31. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Robert, this is this is Chris. I had the same recollection, and we had a discussion about the timing of that and whether providers would be able to complete the GL template by September without the support of the audited financials. Uh, for from an accuracy perspective, I think it's it. They're used to being you know doing the cost report due in December. Um, I, I think uh, September from a turnaround from June 30th is pretty quick. Yeah, Chris, so if you recall in the past, what we stated was that in lieu of audited financial statements, uh, the, the provider organization would just attest to the accuracy of the data to the best of their knowledge. Um, if, you know, we push it any further, then it will impact our ability to analyze the data in a, in a manner that would be timely enough to impact the uh, any updates to the rate methodology. So Robert, the so the GL tool does not need to tie out to the audit? No, no. It, again, um, we're just asking the providers to attest that the information, the data they're providing is you know, accurate to the best of their knowledge. Okay, and then so are, um, are you are you then are you then asking for the audited financials in December? You, you're still asking for the audited financials in December, but they're not they won't tie to what we've submitted in September. That's correct, uh, Karen. The audited financial statements are a, a requirement, um, and those will be due December 31st. Any other questions related to the general ledger template? And um, again, Kristen is going to touch on um, that topic a little later in the presentation as well. Uh, clarity on when in September, and and what I'm going to recommend is the 30th, just because. That's correct. Thank you. That's correct. September 30th. Okay, and then we'll uh, pivot and have a discussion uh, related to the methodologies um, between Max, DDA, um, Hilltop, and Optimus. This is, um, you know, briefing this group on, on, on a meeting that we had shortly after the last RAG meeting. And then, uh, as the um, secretary mentioned, we'll talk about the training component. Um, the results and a brief review of the recommendations will be shared as well later in the presentation by uh, Nick Burton, our director of programs. Okay, so next we'll be discussing the FY24 third quarter rates. If we could advance the slide, please. Okay, so this slide is a response to a request from the RREG for clarification on how the COLA adjustment will be moved uh, forward. The key themes for the fiscal year 2024 Q3 rate cycle, which um, begins January 1 with the implementation of the, the additional 8% to account for the accelerated COLAs um, are as followed. So what you'll see is we'll be shifting 
that 8% combined wage growth factor that was initially planned for fiscal years 25 and 26 to fiscal year 2024. And, and this shift is expected to result in an approximate 7.7% increase over the original fiscal year 2024 rates. Robert, is there any way to, I mean, I guess it's, the ship has sailed, but I guess I was wondering if there was any way to actually make that adjustment so that it actually hits the full 8%. No, there's, uh, that's not feasible, Laura. As you mentioned, we've already um, have our finalized budget. And when this was initially calculated, it was calculated based on the uh, baseline um, FY23 rates. And so that's why the net effect is 7.7 .7 on the FY24 rates. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. So this is the, a summary of DBA decisions and updates um, related to our rate priorities. We've been referring to this um, all cycle long uh, and what you see here um, in the bold um, is, you know, highlighting, um, you know, the changes that we made to the facility component to the FY25 rates um, as a result of the data we collected using the DCT um, and also uh, for program support. And, and we've shared uh, what the data was kind of showing us um, back in July's meeting. And um, in a few sl slides, you you'll see the impact from a percentage perspective. Next slide, please. So it's just a continuation. Oh, if you can go back one, please. So this is just a continuation of the uh, decision summary and um, line number seven maintain current training component um, again we'll be revisiting that today and giving you some updates on some of the decisions that we've made all right next slide okay so we made a final decision to update the facility component for day habilitation and so that would include both two to one and one to one staffing, as well as small and large group. The current rate, the, the FY24 uh, component for the two to one and the one to one staffing ratio is 21%. And the current rate uh, for fiscal year 24 uh, for the facility component for the small and large group is 23%. So moving forward for FY25, for all four services, uh, it's going to increase to 28.5%. Next slide, please. Um, as the secretary mentioned, uh, we also made a final decision to update the BLS for all meaningful day base rates, except for where the base wage was showing a decrease based on the data. Uh, and we've done that due to concerns on, on volatility and kind of um, coming out of the, the PHE. Um, the impact uh, was shared in the June RREC um, meeting and um, you'll be able to see the uh, a follow up in the attachment. Um, all other services will maintain the FY24 uh, BLS rate uh, with the 12% wage acceleration applied. Great, thank you. Um, next slide, please. Okay, we also made final decision. Um, 
as far as the service adjustment component, we increased that from 3.6% to 4.4% for day habilitation. And this, you know, captures an increased number of closures that we've seen in more recent years. This also represents a 22% increase in this component's value. Okay, and now I'm going to turn it over to Nick Burton, who will cover more about the training matrix and um, some of the decisions we made regarding that. Nick? Thanks, Robert. Uh, Dr. Smalls, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so this is the same slide that we shared in July. And I, I think essentially based on the conversations from the previous cycle to this cycle, we were looking to replace assumptions with actual provider data. Um, that provider data that we received from all of you resulted in kind of some upward and downward adjustments depending on the different factors. And I'll go through those slides. Um, I'll go through those factors in the next two slides and kind of the upward downward adjustment. And then if we can save questions until we get to the final slide, I think that some of those questions might get answered. Um, and then that way you'll have the full picture. So why don't we go to the next slide, Dr. Smalls? So um, like I said earlier, there was some upward and downward adjustments. And I think there's two ways to think about the adjustments, though there were some major impacts to um, the adjustments. And this is kind of highlighting what those major adjustments were. And then on the next slide, I'll talk about some of the minor impacts of the um, adjustments. So this one, of course, shows the major impacts of updating the training model to include the new information and the data that we got. Um, this chart is, is supposed to show directional and approximate magnitude of impacts rather than an exact figure. Um, based on the updated requirements that we had in the uh, training matrix and feedback from the RREG around what level of training should be required for DSPs, um, as well as adding in provider specific training, we do see a significant upward adjustment to the training component. Um, conversely, uh, the prior model had assumed that every DSP would start with none of the training requirements and a factor was previously used to double the training to account for the cost of replacing someone while training, which then would appear to be a double counted adjustment. Um, so those, based on those kind of assumptions and the data we receive, you can kind of see um, through here, just kind of the approximate up and down effects of that. And these are kind of more of the more impactful effects. Um, but next we'll go to some of the minor ones. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So this is the more minor impacts of updating the training model at this point in time. So um, if adding more requirements for ongoing training, having lower weekly hours worked, and adding an adjustment to account for ongoing curriculum changes provided some upward impacts to that rate, or that train that assumption. Um, conversely, having lower turnover and assuming uh, the training programs will be in place for more than two years then had a downward impact, um, which in the previous model was a conservative estimate, estimate that was built into that. Um, it, turnover just appears to be lower based on the data we received, um, but since no impact is being made at this time, there are no exact figures um, associated with that. So if we want to go to slide 15, uh, or the next slide, there are 16, there you go. Um, so kind of a recap here. So when we put all these pieces together and and including the data and the policy changes and the work we did on the training matrix. Overall, we're seeing a reduction to the training component. Um, this would adjust the training component model with data, which we currently only requested for day hab, given the focus of this, of this, this cycle. Um, and based on this review, we decided to maintain the current training components 
for now, and then we'd like to make this topic a focus area for the next cycle. And this will allow us to get more data uh, across our service systems and more time to discuss specific details and methodology shown that in the previous slides. So I'll pause there. Anyone had any immediate questions or reaction? Some of the math questions I'm probably going to punt to Steve and his team, but uh, uh, if there's other, any other general questions. Happy to answer those. Nick, it's Chris. Good morning. Hey, just wanted to just throw out there, what is the plan? And we have it in training. We actually have it in a couple other components too, where we really don't have sufficient data to make decisions. What is the the plan moving forward to obtain that data? Uh, you know, is it something that we're looking at the the data collection tool to be the mechanism to grab? Or are we looking at uh, another mechanism? I mean, like turnover, uh, full time, part time employee counts, all can be, you know, kind of combined into that one document to to grab what we need to grab. But kind of go back to what's our long term data collection strategy, and you know, how can we make that better? Because we we've got a tool. We know we got gaps and pieces that are still missing. Are we able to modify that tool or consider modifying that tool? And we talked about that being a, a living, breathing document, and I think it's going to have to be. Yeah, so I, you know, I'm going to give some additional thoughts, and I don't want to speak necessarily for Bernie or Robert, um, but what I would say is I think overall, and based on the conversations we've had and, and kind of what uh, Bernie and Secretary Scott said at the beginning, data is going to be really critical on our ability to make decisions. And so I think that as part of this conversation that we want to continue to have and look at training more broadly, we're also going to have to have a conversation about how do we get the best data to make those decisions. So I think some of that's going to be a collaborative process. Um, and I think we can look at our current data collection strategies to see how to do that best. Did that answer your question, Christian? Yes and no. I mean, obviously, I know that we're going to continue to look at it, but, I, you know, and it's not just within training. It's within several pieces. Um, you know, we, we, we clearly are missing data. We run it into a kind of brick wall when we don't have it. And understood, we, we need to make decisions based on the data that's coming back. But I think, again, I think as we start to go even between now and the next cycle that we're looking at that data collection tool as that mechanism to grab some of the eyeball pieces. You know, if I'm a provider and I'm filling this this uh, DCT out, uh, you know, if I want to look at all of my information at one time, you know, I'm giving you my wage information. At that time, it would make the most sense to capture full time, part time employees and turnover so that the data that I'm giving you is is aligned. You know, if you ask me for my payroll in, in September and we ask for employee counts in January, February, it could be completely different. Uh, certainly could be a factor that we're not grabbing at the same point in time. So just, again, looking for, and I've said it up a couple times over the last two years, we really need a strong, you know, data collection mission statement or, or you know, a program that's going to give us what we need in the end. And I think we keep piecemealing it together. I think we need to stop come up with all the pieces that we need based on our conversation of what's missing and try to incorporate into a tool now. Uh, if we wait till next cycle to do that, then we're looking at 27 before we're possibly getting uh, sufficient data to make any kind of adjustment. So Christian, I 100% agree with you. And, you know, I don't know if we want to take a few minutes to say what that would look like. Is that something that you and, and the members of the RAG would do as far as at least identify the missing pieces? And then we can go at it again to develop a tool that includes those missing pieces for you to vent. But I am I agree with you 100 percent. Without the data, we can't make informed decisions and agree if we wait, then we're putting it off a year. So I'm happy to take that one on uh, in the off season but clearly need input from all of you. So, so, so agree 100%. So what does that look like, right? Do you go back, do you guys go back to the drawing board to say you're missing the following pieces? And if you add it here, or you can edit the document and then we can look at it. Um, you know, we're also just trying to make it um, 
fillable for the, you know, the majority of the providers out there, right, without the document getting too unwielding. So we want to make sure that the data that we're asking for is going to be used and it's just not we're not just asking for the data to ask for the data. So, so yeah, you know, appreciate guidance or, you know, your opinion on what you think that should look like in the off season, but agree. And, and I certainly appreciate your support on that one. I think it's the key to, to doing what we're, you know, what we're trying to do here. I, I think it would be helpful for the RAG group. Certainly I'd be willing to, to look at that, uh, to have DDA identify where their team feels that would they run into, hey, I don't have enough data right here to make it an informed decision and give us those. And then maybe we can figure out how to collect it and gather it or give recommendations on how to gather it. But the, the key point is what is the DDA team and Optimus team feel that you know they don't have to be able to adjust the pieces that we want to adjust? So, so, and it's not just the pieces, it's the completeness. So I want to just say that, right? If the N is too small, the data is volatile, right? So, so we can't guess when the n is too small so it's not just the pieces which we can certainly add but we really need the more data the better especially it speaks to the stability but if we don't have a large enough n and we have swings it's not enough to just throw out the high and low without knowing the complete picture so so i just want to say that as well so we can go back and identify the pieces based on what you said but we we really need more people filling out the tool. Can, if I can just jump in for a second, I th think that um, making, you know, the, the department has made the completion of the general ledger tool mandatory. So I think the N will be big enough because, you know, obviously it's going to be required. Um, in, in, um, over the last few days in kind of the discussion around program support, non-billable time, um, I think some of us spent some time looking at the definitions that are in the general ledger tool more closely and comparing them to um, the FAQs, the directions, and the feedback in the webinars. And I think there are um, uh, maybe some inconsistencies that my, my bigger concern is not the how many providers complete it, but is the quality of what comes back in light of what might be some inconsistencies and some confusion. Um, and uh, so I, I completely agree that there should be a, we should look at the general ledger tool maybe a little more closely. There was a lot of work to get that done quickly by a group led by Hilltop. Um, we weren't part of that. There was some opportunity to review through this process, but you know, to be honest, you know, you, you sort of find the issues as you really dig in. For providers, they, I think, they find the issues as they really start to contemplate completing it. And so, I think some of those issues, you know, it's the first time for this tool. Some of those issues are gonna, you know, are starting to kind of filter up to the top. So. Anyway, so I would I would concur with that being an important um, inter you know uh, interim process. And in terms of what data is missing, I think that is that would be helpful to know <clears throat> from the department. Uh, and I also think that um, uh, the other piece might be as we set priorities for the next cycle you know, if we can somehow think through what we're going to need. Um, for example, employment is a big issue that keeps popping up as a priority. Um, and so we may want to think about, you know, is, are, is there any data that we particularly need around that or any other priority set by this group um, for the next cycle? Okay, Thank so we'll you. regroup I'll, on this. Oh, go ahead, Robert. I'll go ahead, Laura. I'm good. No, I was just going to say we'll regroup on this and then get back to you with the next step. Um, and maybe we have a, a data meeting outside or in the interim before, not maybe, we'll have a data meeting to figure out what goes in, what goes out based on feedback from all of you. Um, and then, um, so, so for the next cycle, um, that the tool that 
um, that we use has had input from all of you. I know, Laura, you just said you've got some input, but but was kind of later in the game and, and then things came up that, that made uh, changing the tool difficult, but, but we can take a look at that over the next few months um, prior to um, prioritizing. Um, I'll have to work with the team. I don't know when like the drop dead date is for them people to complete the tool, um, but hear you loud and clear as we think about prioritization, what is the data you're gonna need or we all, we're all gonna need um, to get behind whatever it is we're gonna look at during the next RAD session. Great, thank you. Uh, this is Scott, um, and I appreciate the, the graphs, Nick, um, but along with this conversation, it might be helpful to really see how did, where's the data behind the graphs? You know, so as we start to look at, um, you know, the training, what 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 information we need, how, how did, what information did you use? How did you compile that? So I don't know, you know, at some point, whether given the raw data that, that, that developed those graphs um, might also help us to figure out what data we need. I, I have to say it's counterintuitive to me <laughs> that the training hasn't, has, has not increased, um, but that's, you know, subjective, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's just amazing how much training is required and, and you know, Office of Healthcare Quality comes out and, and that's all they're looking for is training on every little thing. So um, looking maybe on, on how those graphs were developed and what that data might also help us figure out what data we need to collect. Yeah, Scott, I think that conversation is gonna be helpful, particularly as we, in the off cycle, get together and, and have a conversation about data. And I think that's gonna help us decide what, what is needed, what's not needed from a data perspective, particularly around training, but just in general. So <clears throat> I don't think there will be a problem to kind of dig deep into how, how we came up with those or how those graphs kind of came to be. And Nick, it's, it's Chris, I, I would kind of second Scott's point there. It, it really is about you know being able to know how the data is being used. You know, the end result of the equation is X, you know, we've got the data, we're putting it through some type of a, a, a process or a, a thought pattern. What is the thought pattern? You know, because that thought pattern will tell us one, what pieces you maybe you're missing. And then also, you know, is it gonna get, is that thought pattern gonna get us to where we wanna go? Absolutely. Great, thank you. A lot of great feedback around um, data. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to, to Bernie to give everyone an update on the DDA's methodology for capturing total provider costs. Bernie? Yeah, we should go to the next slide. Dr. Smalls, next slide, please. Here we go, thank you. So uh, this slide was in response to the questions that we had from the last meeting about the total costs that were uh, captured in, in the BRIC. Uh, and we're all familiar with the BRIC. It's been around for a few years now with all the components. Um, and during the meeting with Max, uh, there was discussion about the current methodology and the process for making changes. I think everybody agreed that a more detailed methodology with additional components like productivity factor, which has come up uh, many times, uh, would be desirable when we are uh, looking at data and able to support uh, those components. So, you know, as we agreed during the meeting, uh, the current data can't support productivity adjustments without, uh, you know, doing further adjustments to the BRIC. Uh, we need to have discussion with the providers. I think the conversation that the secretary just led and uh, that uh, Chris was, Christian was talking about uh, on data and, you know, maybe more robust than what do we do for uh, additional assumptions. And then uh, where we are with uh, considering the next steps to implement that uh, once we uh, land on what we all uh, agree to. 
and that uh, the state, though, is in this point has made a final decision that we've got to stay with the current methodology for the, the 25 rate cycle. You know, otherwise, uh, I don't think we're going to have a robust data that we need. So uh, we know that the current methodology captures the total cost of the providers. Um, you know, we referred to the February 22nd of 2022. Um, full RAG uh, explanation and refresher. I think those were slides 15, 16, and 17 uh, to illustrate how we uh, did total cost and broken down by component rates. And then, you know, we know data is not sufficiently robust, again, as I said, uh, at this time to support that productivity. So, you know, I think we need to collaboratively continue to work together. Uh, I also think that we need to uh, engage earlier on. I think Laura Howell's comment about uh, being um, at the, after, you know, after the horse is out of the barn, then you can take a look at it and and you need to be in the design phase to assist us, I think, uh, earlier on is, is uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page as opposed to we give you a document and it's uh, reactionary. Comments. Yeah, I, I think it would be helpful too. I mean, the, the I look back through that uh, February 25th presentation. There's, I mean, it, there's some little bit of guidance in there, but we don't have the, the meat and potatoes. Um, and it, obviously, we've made some changes to that methodology. So, you know, some significant changes. Would it be possible to kind of get in? And I think that's what we were talking about. Scott and I were talking about a couple minutes ago. Are we able to get the updated kind of working theory? Of, of how we're getting from A to B at this point in time, because we have we have made some a, a handful of changes since then. Absolutely. I mean, if we don't do this together, we're never going to be successful. So you know, we've got to we've got to figure out this collaboration. And if you need additional data, you have insights. The secretary said we have insights. How do we how do we do this and and maybe start addressing this during the uh, quote unquote off cycle? Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that, Bernie. Um, I, I, you know, I think we, you know, I think everybody knows we have concerns about the productivity um, piece and the non-billable time. Um, and we did look back at the February 25th presentation. I, I, I agree with Chris. I, I, I'm not sure I understand. I understand what it says, but I don't see how that actually Think there's a discrepancy between that i think the intent is there um from the beginning but um just for the sake of you know kind of the record i'm not sure we see how the current the way the current methodology has evolved is consistent with capturing the full cost of um of the you know what was intended with the brick so um Hopefully we can figure out how to understand where, you know, kind of you all are saying it's there, we're saying we're concerned it's not, um, and try to figure out how to move forward in a way that um, gets us closer to being on the same page around this issue. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if we're not on the same page, we're going to constantly talk about we're not we're not getting to an outcome we're getting to staying in the process mode in my opinion so we need to get on the same page and and make sure now it doesn't necessarily we're going to agree 100 percent, but you know if we can get closer to agreement then i i think we'll all be uh, in a better place i agree so, so this is maria and um i mean i i, I do appreciate this is you know, the, the data and then the methodology and how you use the data to inform the calculations, it's all interconnected. And, and that was, I think our, our goal is to just make sure that we've got all of the pieces that is need, that are needed um, to help inform um, the different assumptions. And, and um, that was the intent, I think, of the kind of the max tool component of the data collection tool was to try to get to that. Um, and I know part of the conversation that we had um, offline in July with, with DDA and Optimus um, was around the program support component. Um, and, you know, depending on 
the methodology, there's there's kind of two ways to look at it. One, you can do it without a productivity adjustment. Um, if you look at, you know, if you allocate that non-billable time, you know, in, into a different part of the brick, um, and then another, you know, or you need a productivity adjustment. So it, it does tie back to how the math is working and the rate setting um, related to the data. And so um, I, I guess, can we, one of, part of the conversation was, um, you know, in July was a concern around the productivity or the um, program support component. And I know you all landed on, it, it's not, um, there isn't a change, but um, was curious as to where that, you know, how, what, what data you used to, to inform the, um, the result that there wasn't a need to make a change to the program support component of the day have because I know again it's it's tied to the definitions and then how the data was being used in the cal in the calculations. So is there clarification on the program support and what data you did you not have the data or did you not um, feel that the data was complete or quality or the calculation didn't support a change? Chris, are you able to uh, address that? What I can say is I believe, almost certain, that we have a, a, a spreadsheet that kind of shows the, the crosswalk from, you know, the data we received from the, the last general ledger um, refresh and how those kind of crosswalk over to each of the components um, that we can share. But I'll uh, see if Chris has anything to add from Optimus. Um, yeah, I agree with what Robert's saying. Um, if there's other pieces that we need to share uh, to make sure that, you know, we've been transparent, I think we're happy to do that. Um, we did have uh, a presentation, um, I'm not sure if it was uh, two months ago, I think, where we walked through what the results were from the data collection tool. And so that was uh, what drove the decision. And that's just kind of the analysis of the data that we had available. Um, so that was the, the data piece that we were aiming to share. But if there's other pieces that um, would be helpful for us to share, we're certainly open to that. Um, yeah, and I think um, as our follow-up, I think we we had we had some of the same data, and so we were coming up with a different calculation. And I think Optimus confirmed that that in in the program support component, um, you were using the Max tool. And, and just the non-billable or the um, non-DSP um, costs and, and, and excluding the, um, the, the time that a DSP might spend on program support that isn't billable, um, which seemed to conflict with the definitions that are in the tool. So that's where we were um, a bit confused and, and, and it, it sounds like you all didn't agree with the definition <laughs> that we were using um, and, and the clarification. So that's where um, I guess I, I, it would be helpful to understand the definition so, of what's in program support um, to make so sure Marie, that we're using the data. I, I think we need to take this offline. So, so and I, okay. I, I said this previously. So in, I, I, not previously, I said it offline to someone else. Um, in regular rate setting process, so if we use the MCOs, we get differing opinions with the actuaries all the time and the methodology and the definitions. And when there's a differentiation of the opinion, we have the MIA to go to, right? But oftentimes actuaries and people doing the calculations don't agree for a variety of reasons based on the assumptions and the definitions. And, and we go, we have, there's a third party to go to. That doesn't exist in in the DDA world, one. Two, we don't have the years of um, data that we can look to to validate the assumptions that we're making. So, so to have this discussion without having a third party in place to differentiate who's right or who's wrong, you quite frankly, if went to a third person, would get a different result. So I think to Chris's point, we can share the data, we can share the assumptions. They may not align with your assumptions, but but that is, um, I think, 
part of, at least in my experience, I've certainly been in lots of places where people come to different conclusions with the same set of numbers. And, and I, I, well, <laughs> yeah, I understand that actuaries might not agree. I think we're, I, I think I'm trying to just understand the definitions or what goes into program support and whether that includes non-billable DSP time or not, which I think is a pretty key component to getting the right data to then inform the rate setting. So, um, so maybe it's just clarifying the definitions and then making sure that you have the data that lines up with those definitions to do the, the calculations accurately. And can I just jump in and say, um, I think this goes back to um, my comments earlier about as we kind of dug into um, all of the discussion around these issues, we see different definitions and different guidance. So very worried about what that means for the, the, the uh, usability of the general ledger tool uh, data and really understanding um, where sort of where everything is and all the components of the non-billable time where where are those pieces is any piece missing if so do we need more data for that so i think um you know we're not interested in the debate we've had that we, ha we haven't been able to come to an agreement so you know just to support what maria is saying i think we want to understand and if there is something missing i don't think that's the intent of the department to exclude something so it to me, it's a little bit of a red flag. Can we figure out how to share information in a way that we can either see that, yes, it really is there, or no, it's really not, and then what do we do about that? Well, I think that gets to when, you know, we need to, uh, earlier conversation about data and, you know, what are we looking at and uh, what's are we in agreement? You know, as I said earlier, you know, we may not agree 100% on everything, but, you know, the closer we can get, we can get out of a process mode here and into an outcome, right? And make sure it's clear to everybody, like for the general ledgers and uh, everything else that we need to continue with. So I think the spreadsheet you all, you know, I think Chris mentioned and um, offered to share would be a really helpful place to start at this point. So thank you for that. Great, thank you everyone. And I forgot to mention in the beginning um, that I'm not able to show my salt and pepper gold tea on the screen today because I was having some technical difficulties. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen from Hilltop to talk about the general ledger data collection. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, it's great that there's already been so much discussion on the general ledger template during the meeting today. I think it really reiterates the importance of the data and how essential it is for all providers to understand the tool and to be able to submit data to inform the process. Um, during many of the meetings this year, we did talk about the development process, um, how intentional it was, and how many of the stakeholders that we engaged. So I do think it's really important to talk a little bit about and just remind everyone that process that we engaged in. We started that process last August, um, so over a year ago, um, to pull together the template with information from Optimus on past data collection, consulting with DBA, on the policies um, that should also be incorporated. And then we did provide the opportunity for the RAG to review that document in October, as well as inviting all of the RAG members to engage in our provider work group um, that did meet for three months um, to review the tool, provide feedback, you know, as well as make suggestions for changes um, that we did incorporate into the next version of the tool. 
there was only one provider group from the RAG who participated in that group. Um, we gave a really good overview of all of the providers who participated, making sure we engaged all the different regions and all the different types of providers as well as provider sizes. Um, so those are all in old RAG slides um, if you want to go back and review. Um, but then out comes of that provider work group, we did share two revised versions of the template with the RAG for your feedback. Um, we really did see the RAG as an essential partner in the process for the development of the tool. Um, and so we want to make sure that you understand that we did incorporate your feedback and we are always willing to you know, hear um, additional feedback that you have. Um, and so I know Laura mentioned there's been some additional review of the guidelines and the trainings. And so we are happy to take the feedback that you're able to share where you're seeing inconsistencies. Because um, again, the goal is to make sure that all providers understand the tool and the data that's to be collected. We also want to talk a little bit about the timing of the tool. Um, and so we did intentionally make the tool available um, in the spring of 2023 because providers gave us the feedback that they needed the information about how the data would be collected in order to adjust their systems to be able to collect the data moving forward. And so there was a decision made not to collect historical data with the tool, but to allow providers the opportunity to see the tool, how the data would be collected, and update their system so that they would be able to input the data and provide it back to the DBA as requested. Um, and so we shared the tool in the spring of 23 to prepare for the FY 2024 data collection. And so as Robert mentioned earlier, and there was a discussion, the data on that tool for Festival 24 will be due on September 30th, 2024, to allow time for the data to be cleaned and reviewed and aggregated to be able to inform the upcoming rate setting cycle. Um, and so I do think it's important that as we are collecting data for fiscal 24 and the way the data collection will be timelines, that data will not be available to you until we get to the fiscal year 27 rate setting cycle. Mm -hmm. And so because that won't be available for the upcoming rate setting cycle, there will continue to rely on providers to submitting data to be in, on a data collection tool um, that will inform the priority, priorities you know, as determined to drive that data driven process. And so, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, and, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to clarify that um, Max did request multiple times to be part of that work group, and we weren't. That offer was not taken, um, or we, you know, we were not invited to be part of that. So our our opportunity. I just don't want anybody to think that we were at that table and then came back months later. We, the opportunity was through the RAG, which just honestly was not an easy um, way to provide feedback. So, um, I mean, I'm glad we're gonna have, I'm glad you all are open to discussion now, but I just wanted to clarify that. No, I appreciate um, that clarification, Laura. Um, but I will say that I, I recall getting direct feedback from Max on two separate occasions. And so we do appreciate that you were able to review the tool um, and send that back to us. Oh, this is uh, Chris. Oh, go ahead. I'm not sure who to ask the question to, but at some point, when will providers get an updated um, brick analysis? You know, the one I've been using is a couple of years old. We now have new percentages across different categories we have new last week. When when will the that document be distributed to us? Hi, um this is Robert. We can get that sent out uh, perhaps by the end of tomorrow. End of day tomorrow we'll get it posted to the site. That'd be great. We're trying to align our business you know models and along with the with, with this uh, data collection tool to the new um, Format, so that'd be very helpful. Any other questions related to the general ledger data collection tool? So I have a question to, for Kristen. Um, are you getting feedback from the providers around, you know, just questions? Are they, um, I, I'm curious as to, to where there's additional clarification. And I saw the FAQs and, and, and they're super helpful. Um, and, and I do think the GL tool has has you know the opportunity to address some of the um, the concerns that we've had uh, around some of the past data collection tools. 
um, because of the, the clarifications and the, and the documentation. Um, and so curious as to what you're finding, at least in the, in the latest rounds of these technical assistance sessions with providers that would warrant additional clarification of, of the data. Yeah. Um, so Maria, that's a great question um, and a great way for me to put my plug in um, <laughs> to the RA. I will say we've had very limited outreach from providers. We actually only, following technical assistance sessions, we even have only had one provider reach out with a clarification question. Um, so we really are looking for the RA members to work and communicate with your affiliated provider really on the importance of timely and accurate completion of the tool. Um, and that it, you know, really to get to have a data-driven process, we need the data from the provider network. Um, so we are really pushing and asking, asking you to be proactive with your partners and engage them and have them reach out for technical assistance. Um, they can contact us directly. We're happy to answer questions, jump on a call, jump on a, you know, a quick WebEx, whatever is needed um, to make sure that they have the information they need to be able to complete the tool. No, that's helpful. And then I think maybe as a follow-up, it, it would be helpful to understand how um, you all or, or Optimus or DDA is, is thinking about taking that data from the GL tool to then help inform the BRIC. Because I think that's where, you know, if, if we understood, you know, okay, you're going to take column X and <laughs> divide it by Y <laughs> is the hope. If you get good quality data, then we can make sure we understand, um, you know, just how that all those different pieces fit together. Because that's a very comprehensive tool. Um, and so I think just understanding how that tool will then translate into um, to help inform future adjustments to the brick would be really, really helpful. Gosh, Marie, I wish I had thought of that. Um, <laughs> that's it's a, it's a good point to, to understand how that how those numbers are going to be crunched. Um, it's, a, it's good good to get that out ahead of us as well. Great, thank you. Any other questions related to the general ledger data collection tool? Okay, next slide. Um, before we discuss walk-on items or have other open discussion, um, I'd like to take five to 10 minutes just to start to discuss rate priorities for the FY 2026 cycle so that, you know, we at least get one step ahead of that cycle. Um, so when we reconvene in January, it, it's a matter of you know, prioritizing those priorities. Um, so, like to hear from from the group what they would like to see as a FY twenty six rate priority. Well, I'll I'll throw out a couple things. One is I think to to get to a better understanding of the um you know kind of what maria just said in terms of the uh ensuring that productivity all of productivity is included in the um, data collection and the methodology um i also think that um employ you know what we hear from providers is that there remains a great deal of concern about the employment rate um so rate so i think uh it would be good for that to be a priority thanks laura any anyone else well scott just when we're talking productivity it would be all services it doesn't impact you know, group home as much, but it certainly impacts, you know, personal support, any community-based services when we look at, you know, how much time are the staff able to deliver a service. And then, you know, back to Nick's comment on the training, I think just because I just 
and overwhelmed by the amount of training that I see that we have to do. So, so somehow capturing some of that. And that would dovetail with productivity since training is a piece of it that the, that the department has acknowledged um, having in the training component, but it, it would fit in that scope. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Robert, this is Chris. Uh, I think I'd like to keep on the table. We had a discussion about acuity and whether or not that that is still a factor that needs to be considered moving forward. I think we've left it alone for now, but I don't want it to fall off the table and not come back. Okay, thank this, you, Chris. This may relate, but nursing is also, and I don't know if it relates to acuity, but um, and I don't know, just, just something to, to consider the amount of nursing supports and whether it's really properly funded. Sorry, Scott, I want to make certain I heard that correctly. You said nursing supports? Registered. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sorry, I, um, you cut off and I, I didn't hear the first part of it. Just wanted to make certain I captured it. Scott, can I ask a clarifying question? Because there's nursing supports, but that doesn't cover nursing costs in, you know, like residential services so do you mean no all, I, thank you. you mean all of it thank you yes i mean some of the nursing supports you can bill for but so much of it is assumed to be in the rates and i just don't see that it's adequate um there's just so much again being pushed for, from a nursing standpoint you know pushing the medical model more and more <laughs> even though that's not what we all want so i don't laura i don't know if that's what you were asking that, that is what I was asking. I thought I just thought we needed to clarify which piece you meant, or you meant both pieces. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Robert, to, to follow up on Scott's point, you know, when we're looking at nursing services and the impact on providers, it's becoming much more difficult to retain nurses. Uh, we've gone from competing against uh, you know, the rest of, of the world in trying to get those nurses, but uh, there's been a specific shift in uh, where nurses want to work with respect to self-directed services. Uh, the funding in self-directed for nursing tends to be significantly higher and they can pay higher. Uh, and as a provider, I've seen, you know, nurses get sucked away from my agency and, you know, they're, they're doing uh, self-directed because it's more profitable for them. I just think that that needs to be a factor when we're looking at those those nursing components. Okay, noted. Any anyone else? Scott, I'm not sure this is fits into this uh, conversation, but I do wonder about self-directed costs um, and and reimbursement rates. I don't I don't know that it fits in here, but I. I often wonder about that. So Scott, it doesn't fit in here, but I wonder too. So we're looking at that and we're happy to report back, but I don't know if it fits in this discussion, except for parity to the comment. That we're glad to hear you're looking at that. Because it, it well, is I'm looking at it. It's becoming a bigger and bigger issue, I think, and concern. Well, and I'll say it on the record, I think we've created some perverse incentives in the system. I would definitely agree with that. Okay, thanks everyone for providing that feedback. We're also going to use uh, these great priorities to start having conversations re related to data and the type of data we should be thinking about collecting um, for these priorities. And again, we'll be able, we'll, we'll take this list, there may be some other priorities that come up um, and we'll need to prioritize it based on, you know, the, the amount of time we have each cycle. Um, and there'll be other variables like, you know, 
what what are the um, demands from a data perspective, et cetera, that uh, should go into that decision making process. But we'll definitely um, be reaching out to talk about uh, next steps related to, to data and, and how to collect it and start creating the data dictionaries for each of these um, identified priorities. Okay, so again, as always, I want to thank all of you for your thoughtful comments. But before we move on to adjournment, I'd like to open it up for discussion and or any walk-on items folks may have. Robert, can I just, um, I, I think the last slide maybe talks about the next cycle. And I, I wasn't sure if you were gonna touch on that or not, but I was just gonna ask that it says, you know, it begins in January, which we expected, um, and that the calendar will be shared in December. If there is any way to share it a little earlier, just um, a month, notice or a little less might get tough for folks to make sure they've got the dates on their calendar. Yes, I'm, we should be able to do that. More. Excuse me, thank you. Great. This is Scott. I'd like to make a comment that I purposely did not make anywhere else. Um, and, and it's a comment that I've made before, and people are tired of probably tired of hearing me say it. And the good news is you won't ever hear me say it again. Uh, but I, I want to make a comment on the uh, geographic differential, and, and just to remind us all that um, under PCIS the differential was somewhere around seven percent, meaning the five counties uh, were paid seven percent higher than than the other counties. And now it's up to thirteen some percent, and it's going to go up more. As a reminder, there's 24 jurisdictions in this state, um, five of which are paid almost twice the amount for the exact same service than the 19 other jurisdictions. And uh, I, I know a lot of providers in those five jurisdictions. They do a fantastic job. Um, the DSPs that work with uh, families in those jurisdictions do a fantastic job. This is not in any way to disparage that. And it's not in any way to suggest that there's an overpayment. I, I don't believe that. I think the five counties uh, that are getting the, the higher rate, they, they need that. Uh, my comment is is the variance. Um, and I, we need to be data driven. Believe me, I understand the BRIC method. I understand the BLS. We need to be data driven. But there's another tool that statisticians often use um, to evaluate data. And it's it's called the smell test. And I think if you pull out this uh, vari variance of, uh, you know, well, it's between 7 and 13 percent for 19 of the jurisdictions, and if you take a deep smell on that, I, I think you're going to find out that it smells kind of rotten. That's, that's quite a variance. You know, it's kind of like when you go on vacation and, and you come back and you, you look in the fridge and there's the milk and you wonder, is that milk still good? And you open the cap and oh, no, that milk is not good. At some point, we're going to have to narrow that gap uh, uh, between those jurisdictions, not taking anything away from anybody. We're going to have to narrow that gap, though, and, and that's going to require all of us to support it. It means that it's going to, at some point, we're going to have to look at does, does those other 19 jurisdictions get an extra 3%? You know, how do we narrow that? Um, and it's going to require providers in, in those five jurisdictions to support it. It's going to require the uh, the political people to support it and recognize, yeah, uh, you know, those 19 jurisdictions are going to get just a tad bit more than those five jurisdictions to narrow that. And, and we're going to have to come together as a group. Um, so, again, you know, the, the smell test uh, is, is, a, is a legitimate <laughs> um, statistical uh, tool, and uh, but I, I purposely chose to, to hold this to the end. Thank you. Just in terms of Scott's point, we certainly hear, particularly from providers that are, you know, in the lower rate class, the rest of state, that abut a, a geographic differential state, uh, county, I'm sorry, yeah, from one county to the other, where there's such a big rate difference and therefore a big difference in what um, 
can be paid for wages, uh, it really creates some significant inequities. And there are some components that don't make a lot of sense, like Howard County, for example, is in the rest of state um, because of its kind of metropolitan <laughs> nature, despite being in, you know, if you pulled it out county by county, I think it would probably look very similar to those higher cost counties like Montgomery County. So um, I just, I, I agree with Scott that I don't know if it will be looked at, but in whether there's any acceptable methodology, like some kind of smoothing between rates, right? so you don't have such big differentials. Um, I keep saying states, I mean counties, my apology, smoothing between the different rates um, that apply to different counties. But um, I think it's at least something we need to think about in, term, in terms of how we move forward long term. Any other walk on items or, or discussions? Robert, this is Chris. Uh, we in our last meeting had talked obviously significantly about productivity and billable, non billable components. And uh, with the BLS wage, with the decision of the department that there's productivity built into the BLS wage, uh, I think we had requested to kind of get a sense of what that productivity factor would be. Uh, you know, when BLS is published, uh, you know, it goes out to, uh, you were having conversations obviously with legislators, with, with our DSPs, they see that number and they want to know why, you know, they're not getting paid that number or a legislator, you know, having a conversation where well, we're paying uh, X dollars when in fact productivity factor drops it down, uh, you know, somewhat significantly. Is there a way for us to be able, you know, can you share what that productivity factor is with the BLS so that we can get down to, you know, what the wage really is? Um, Chris, is that data readily available? And can we, well, we got to send that with the um, the other requested spreadsheet. Uh, we do have wage information that we were able to get from the providers in the most recent data collection tool, um, and then we do have the uh, assumptions that go into the rate development. So I think um, we could pull a comparison with that. Um, and share that information if that's uh, if that's DDA's you know decision on how to proceed there. Um, we could certainly have more discussions on um, how that kind of information uh, would come about or how we would share that um, since we don't have an explicit assumption there. Uh, but that's uh, certainly a path that we could take. Uh, can I just say I, I I don't think that the I feel like we're doing sort of apples and oranges. There's the BLS wage that's in the rate that was in is uh, perhaps a little aspirational, but is certainly was intended to be, you know, this is an appropriate wage to cover the array of wages for DSPs from entry to long term. Um, so if the approach is what we're really going to look at is what do you, what providers are currently paying and measure the difference that's feels like it's really instead of saying you know here's what we believe the rate should be which is the approach dda has always taken that that is shifting to we're going to back into a number based on what you're currently paying and then kind of shoehorn uh productivity into that number so just i just chris since you mentioned it i just have to comment that we would have really serious concerns about that uh, okay, so i don't want to get into that one second i don't want to get into the methodology right now so why don't we we discuss what we're going to send you you take a look at it and then we can have the discussion off cycle right because 
we're going to keep going back and forth on this issue. And, um, you know, we've made the decision. We're going to be as transparent as we can, and you can shoot holes after it. But without seeing it based on what people are saying, I think there's lots of room for interpretation. And I'd rather we get you the data and the numbers and how we did it, and then you can go, go from there. Yeah, we, we would look forward to seeing that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lord, the comments made related to the um, general ledger data collection tool weren't uh, lost on me. So I want to circle back with you to find out where the breakdown occurred because I know we've made uh, very concerted efforts of trying to get as many people at the table as possible um, so that they could have input um, into the tool. I know we were concerned about the um, small number of providers. Uh, so I'll, I'll reach out to you offline to, to get more information. Okay. Um, Slide 22, please. Okay, so this um, is the link to the Rate Review Advisory Group materials. Um, please feel free to go there um, to review the, the me meeting minutes, uh, uh, this video, as well as other information. And Laura, based on your request, uh, we'll get the calendar uh, solidified and sent out to you all within the next few weeks so that folks have time to train. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to um, our secretary and deputy secretary to close this out. Bernie, do you have anything before I go? No, I just want to thank everybody. I mean, I think it's been a, a robust and, and uh, productive conversation about where we go and next steps, how do we continue to collaborate and and uh, what data we need to get and how do we evaluate it and take a look at this. So with that, I want to thank everybody. Yeah, and just uh, echo Bernie's comments. So um, uh, we have a, a data group that um, we're going to work on and uh, Christian, I, you know, I like the idea of a data collection mission statement and, and what that means. And so we'll make sure that the pieces that have been missing from the data are filled in. And, uh, you know, once we do that and we think about next steps, um, we can also figure out the way forward to the comments that have been made about the, the brick. Um, and then, Laura, to the comment that you just made, um, we'll get you the methodology and the assumptions that were built into that. But we appreciate everyone's feedback and uh, thank you.